Welcome to Born to be Barefoot. I'm your host, Stuart Gordon, with my co-host, Katie Suyuki. So welcome to be Born to be Barefoot, a podcast sponsored by Barefoot Science Insoles. Now, my name is Stuart Gordon. I'm one of the co-hosts of this podcast. My co-host is a lady called Katie Suyuki. And actually, what we're going to do today is interview Katie, because we hadn't met before we did this podcast uh, as co-hosts, and um, she's got a great story. She's got a great background. So I said, let's interview Katie. Let's get an insight into how it, what it is that t- it takes to become an Olympian. Katie's a, an Olympic snowboarder for Canada, and I want to find out how she got there. How did, what did she do? What dedication it took? What sacrifices she had to make? What the training schedule was like? And uh, give us a picture, Katie, of what it's like as well, being in that Olympic village, which I'm guessing as a bunch of snowboarders was pretty riotous. But let's go back to the beginning. <laughs> so first and foremost, <laughs> welcome, Katie, to our podcast. <laughs> oh, thank you, Stuart. Always a pleasure to be uh, with you on this podcast. Ah, so here we go. So come on. Let's go a little bit back forwards and then backwards. So <laughs> how, far, how far back do we go? Which, you know, to... I'm going to start, start off with where you... Which Olympics did you go to? Let's start from then, then we'll work backwards a little bit. Well, it I went to the 2014 Sochi Games, but it really started back in uh, 2010 during the Vancouver Games. Well, sorry, it really started back for Torino, which was uh, 2006. And mm-hmm. um, so I got on the national team uh, by doing well and, and winning nationals. And that was, uh, I guess, 2009, 2008, one of those years. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't really on the radar. And then I won a nationals and then they put me on the team. And there was a group of us that um, looked like we were getting enough points to actually get to Torino. But the way how um, national team selection or sorry, Olympic team selections are somehow sometimes they're set up to really protect their national team members. So even though um, there was a few of us who had enough points to probably go and and get into selection, um, we actually got blocked by the selection process. So um, that was kind of like the the dangling carrot of like, oh, this this can actually be something, um, you know, like let's let's look towards uh, 2010. Mm. So, so, um, so close yet so far, really, wasn't it on that occasion? Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So, you know, we started going towards 2010 and I was on the national team and and going through it and doing it. And it was kind of the same thing happened, like the way how selection was set up, it kind of protected certain athletes. And then the other athletes that were trying to get into the bubble had a little bit more of a challenging time. So for 2010, I got to go to the games uh, because I ended up being a forerunner because it was in Canada. Then like the way how the contest goes is that they kind of send, I'd like to call them guinea pigs down the half pipe so that the judges can warm up their judging. Okay. So I got to be this, this forerunner at the Olympics. <laughs> so it's so it's like, there's the, uh, we didn't get to walk in with that. Well, and I was, um, a forerunner and I was uh, a sub. So if anyone got hurt, then I was like ready to go. So right. I was there. I was like in Vancouver. My parents came. We got a bit of a, of the Olympic kit. We got, you know, our own coach and we rode the half pipe with the lights on us and everything. And I was the guinea pig that warmed up the judges and and um, actually rode like pretty decent, you know, because well, <laughs> you're like in the perfect half pipe and the lights are on. and. And yeah, so I had a, 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 another taste of uh, the Olympics in 2010, but um, I had missed the team. And um, looking back, I didn't really feel like the national team program had my back or, mm-hmm. um, you know, did everything to kind of get me there. Or, uh, things weren't exactly transparent. So um, that's when I decided to leave the national team and go private which is kind of, you know, a daunting thing to do because the way how it's set up in Canada is that if you're not a part of the national team program, then you don't get any funding. You get nothing. You can't, you don't qualify for any grants, nothing. So 
then I had to go down this, this whole like fundraising route because I didn't quite have the money to go do it. And actually, um, I was supposed to go to like, you know, university, like it was all set up to go to university all like my, we'd all been saving. And so I kind of asked my parents then, can I use this money to actually set me up to go to the Olympics? Because in Canada, when when you make it there and you, and you go to the Olympics and get on the national team for every year that you're a part of it, uh, Canada will pay for a year of post-secondary school. So I was like, it's kind of putting my eggs in one basket, but when I make it, I'll still have it there because I'll get these other grants to be able to go further education. So my parents like, okay, let's do it. Let me backtrack a bit. Going into 2010, my, my, or sorry, 2006, my boyfriend at the time was like really high up on the national team. He was like ranked number one in Canada. He was like podium and winning world cups. Um, wow. And he was like, he, he always had a really good kind of coaching ethic, but we broke up and, you know, life goes on. And, and uh, he actually left the sport because he had a friend die and he got like really traumatized. So he was like, Oh, I'm going to go like hide out and be a hermit because he got traumatized from his friend. So he left wow. the sport and I didn't see anything like he was supposed to go to 2010 and that was going to be his second Olympics. But then um, he left the sport, became a hermit. So in 2000 and, and about 2011, 2012, uh, and I, I going private, I'm fundraising all for myself, pulling out all, all the money. And I, I, I went to him and I was like, you know, his name's Crispin Lipscomb. I was like, Crispin, I don't have a coach. You've done it. You've planned it. He, he was getting his coaching module. So I'm like, you're doing your coaching modules. Like, let, let's go do this. Like, take me to the Olympics. I need you. So mm -hmm. he agreed and, and he came out of um, retirement or not really with like competitive time. He came out again and and we started started doing this. We started going to all these World Cups. I, I made it so that I could get starts because that was a whole other thing. Like to get a World Cup start, you really have to like, you know, like work with the national. So I'm running this program parallel with the national team and I'm, I'm trying to get these World Cup starts so that I can get my foot in the door. So they, they let me do that. They let me bring my private coach to these world cups and we start like building the points to go towards 2014. So in about, and I'm, I'm doing pretty good. So in about 2013 ish, you know, we're like heading into the Olympics. It's the last kind of uh, uh, six months or eight months or whatever going in and I'm doing really well. And then the national team turns around and says to me, they're like, Katie, it looks like you, uh, you might be going to the games. Like, you know, you're doing really good, but, um, you can't bring your you can't bring your private coach. You have to leave your private coach and you have to come with us. And I was kind of like, what do you mean I can't bring my private coach? Like I'm doing everything you guys want me to. I'm jumping through the hoops, whatever. This is my team, you know, and mm. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. There's, some, there's some politics with a small p going on there, isn't there? Oh, cracky. oh yeah, and anyone, any guys out there that have dealt with a national team before, I don't care what sport, there's always these types of politics that go on. So mm -hmm. I'm sure people are listening to this and they're like, yeah, yeah, I hear yeah, you. Yeah, this, this, or... this, is, this is one of the reasons I wanted to do this today, because as a punter, you know, just as a member of the public watching <laughs> Olympics, we kind of, you get an, an odd snippet of an interview about this sort of thing, but People don't tend to say it because obviously at the time they, they can't risk saying it because they could be upset in the apple cart. And then maybe afterwards they calm down a little bit and they're, they've done it and they're happy and, and so on. So this is actually quite, I, I find it fascinating as a sports you know, observer and, and so on. And this must go on time and time again. I mean, there was a crazy oh, thing. Yeah, yeah. you saw it. There was a guy called Eddie yeah. the Eagle who, who did the, yeah. the big jump thing. And there was a, a film made about that and there was some interesting politics that were evident there but this is this is yeah, well yeah, Eddie, is Eddie Eagle Eye. yeah yeah he was uh crazy but um yeah so go on so you've you've got to this point they've said yeah you can be in the team but Crispin he's got to go back and clear off somewhere else Not yeah nice. so they're like okay now you got to jump on board with our team and and you have to use our coach and you have to use our stuff. And so, and I'm like already budgeted to like, you know, I'm still fundraising, like, and like Stuart, man, I, I like pinched and pulled steel, stole whatever I could to be able to get the funding mm. for this. Like I literally 
sold food at my brother's wakeboard tournaments. I did like gift baskets. I was like asking anyone for, for like, you know, product donations so that I could raffle it off. I had, I held three golf tournaments. I did two galas. <laughs> like, And this is all this, stuff that uh... I'm organized. I mean, like my folks helped me organize and I had some people organize, but a lot of it I did, did myself, mm. you know, this is not, this is not Post- the glamorous sports career that we sometimes think happens for people. I mean, we know people have to struggle at different sports, but this is real basic stuff isn't it you're right down there digging wow yeah. determination yeah. determination this is one of the things i wanted oh, to I hear like, about great stuff yeah yeah i'm like we're, we're doing this we're doing and i'm really lucky because like my folks say they they had my back the whole mm. time you know and um you know we're, we come from like i come from a middle class family like you know i'm not we're not like dirt poor or whatever because you know the reality is that anyone who's successful in sport probably comes from some little bit of money background like it's pretty much next to impossible unless the government picks you up and they start funding you Mm -hmm. and you're amazing for someone to go out there and and go to the olympics or do you know major major sport it's fairly unheard of you know um anyway so so the national team turns around says crispin can't come with you and i'm like oh man i really need crispin to come with me and like like i said crispin was like the top of his game when he was in it so I went to Crispin and I was like, Crispin, we got this many World Cups left. This is where the Canadians are sitting on the points list. Cause like basically he had to beat the Canadian men to be able to go. Cause I, cause I turned to him, I was like, Crispin, you're coming to the Olympics with me. Like you need to qualify now so that we can go together and I can still do this. And, and he was quite, wow. you know, that was daunting for him because he hadn't competed in like, you know, an Olympic cycle and a half. And, Thanks. You know, but but he saw the guys out there and like he's, you know, he's a Leo. He's like pretty competitive anyway. So some <laughs> I must have said something right, because I got the phone call back and it was like, all right, Katie, let, let's go do this. Let's go show this team, you know, <laughs> and awesome. you, like you don't really want to go against like the, the national team and everything. Like you want to play with them. But we were like, let's go get these guys, you know, let's go show mm. them. So. You know, it was kind of like the last period to qualify. I think there was like maybe three or four World Cups left. And um, it was a training camp in New Zealand. And we came down to New Zealand. And that's when Crispin had to start training. So it's pretty funny. So we <laughs> we called ourselves the coach leads because <laughs> we, were, we were training and coaching each other. Like, you know, right. it'd be like, I go do a run. He'd film me. Then we'd have a chat and like, you know, do, go go through our drill or whatever. And then like we'd like switch around and then it'd be like Crispin's time. Right. Mm. So we get through these World Cups and Crispin's like gaining points. Like I'm doing well. I, I'm looking pretty good to go. I'm like second from the top. And, uh, you know, the next one behind me is, is uh, got a good point cushion between us. So it ends up that Crispin qualifies he beats out the Canadian men and he like nails Canada. Cause what happens is you need to go and compete first. You have to win Canada a spot. And then there's a selection process to see who's going to the Olympics to, to who's going to use that spot. So like in Canada, we don't have like a million athletes. Our pool for snowboarding is, is uh, shallow compared to like the States, like the States, they can send their rookie team to go and get secure the country spots while they're resting their elite team and then okay, they go and send yeah. the elite team in. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? But can't, yeah. we don't have, and like a lot of other countries, they don't, we don't have that luxury of doing that. So we we're like, everyone's going, it's like pit race of mm. getting these spots and then fighting it out for these spots. So Crispin makes it and everyone's like, Oh no. Cause like the national team is like, <laughs> Oh, we didn't really want this to happen. Right. And then we're, so it's, it's pretty cool when when we get the phone call. Like I'll never forget it. We were in Quebec because that was where the last World Cup was before the selection. And uh, oh my god, I like always get emotional whenever I say. Oh that. yeah, you should. Yeah. <laughs> we we were having dinner, and I got the phone calls with my parents. I got the phone call, and it was like, oh, okay, we're going. And it was like emotional time, but then it really sunk in when Crispin called me, and we're at this like fondue place, and Crispin's like, Katie we did it. We are going. <laughs> and I was just like, 
you know, my my wow. mom and I broke down in tears and we're like, it was it was almost like, I mean, it was the start of going to the games, but for me, like that, that was the part of like, yeah. you know, like the hard work paid off all those <laughs> trials and tribulations I'm, of like, <laughs> I'm holding my breath. I'm getting a bit, bit emotional here. This is fantastic. I mean, this is a real, this, this is like a film script in the making. <laughs> Cool runnings, move aside. <laughs> Katie and Crispin step into frame. This is fantastic. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, just, yeah. Yeah. Great stuff. Wow. So, okay. Well, I'm going well, to. Yeah. Can we stop there? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, right. And now I want to wind back and say, okay. So that was, that's amazing. That's a, a story in itself. But so when you're a kid, um, you've got a snowboard, you're out there doing a few bits and bobs what point did you suddenly think I'm actually pretty good at this and I quite fancy going to the Olympics so like snowboarding was just kind of like a thing that I did when I wasn't wakeboarding but then okay. when I was I went to boarding school and I uh, went to like an outdoor ed boarding school and it had the snowboard program and when I was in my senior year it was like oh <laughs> I set my class schedule up so that I had like class, class, spare, spare. And I, I was driving then. So on my class, class, spare, spare days, I actually left school and I went to the snowboard hill and I would like snowboard in the afternoon. So I was right. snowboarding like probably three times a week, half days, okay. and then on weekends as well. So like, you know, because I was like a teenager and I was like, well, do I want to be at school or do I want to like go out and go snowboarding if I can set this up? So I was like, yeah. Tough, tough call, tough call. <laughs> yeah, so I set that up and <laughs> and I was, <laughs> I was leaving school and going snowboarding. And then when I got accepted to university and, uh, but the thing was to defer for a year and like, you know, you go mm. travel, yeah. whatever, right? So I deferred for a year. And I went it because I was like, oh, I'm really liking the snowboarding thing. And and half pipe wasn't necessarily on my radar. It was just like I was actually doing more like slope style, like rails and jumps and stuff. And mm -hmm. half pipe was just something you kind of cruise through. So anyways, I deferred for a year, went out to BC, to British Columbia and like got got a, an apartment with like five guys. No, it was three guys. And it was like one bedroom apartment with this loft that was basically a deck like it was like maybe not even 10 by 10 it was like maybe 8 by 10 or 7 7 by 10 right. and it was right over the the living room and we were living like one dude was living on the couch in the living room i was living on this like deck on the this like loft and then you know there was like a couple in the in the one bedroom and it, <laughs> it was so yeah. small yeah and so i went out to bc <laughs> and i was like i was like literally just you know snowboarding basically for fun snowboarding every day riding powder and, and so what uh, i find interesting here though is that because I, I kind of i mean i've skied and and had a go at snowboarding but you kind of get a feeling as a, again as a sort of as a person like casual snow skier or snowboarder is that those people that end up going to the olympics are kind of born on a snowboard they're out there like the french kids you know we go and we see these french kids whizzling down the slopes at three you know and you didn't do that <laughs> No, well, I mean, back then, s snowboarding was still quite a young, new sport, you know, like it debuted in the Olympics in 2006. Mm -hmm. um, or sorry, not 2006, 1998. So it was, it debuted in 1998 and then 2002 was Salt Lake City. And then, so it was like in between 2002 and 2006 is the time. that. So it only had like two Olympic cycles. So it was like, it's still really fresh Olympic sport. So there wasn't really like, there was no internet that showed like there was no like you well, there was YouTube but it wasn't like how it is now right so yeah. you could still kind of get away with starting quite late and letting a little bit of talent mm. you know ca carry you through before all the hard skills happen nowadays it's totally not like that now mm. kids are in full time programs at like eight years old nine years old you know like. Wow. The, now, now it's like more like traditional sports where you know kids mm -hmm. are in hard hard programs like they're going through the long-term athlete development um model like at a young age like a you know le learn to have fun type thing mm -hmm. so yeah you're right ba back then it was, it was a little bit more casual and i was mm. just kind of on the hill and i was at the half pipe in bc and i got talent id'd by the coach there his name's um andrew george 
and he was he's a was a fantastic coach like he was and it's not just on snow coaching because like all the coaches out there know that like the on on the in sport skill stuff is like one thing but really you're kind of harvesting and developing these the the mental side of the athlete or the person you know you're really trying to work that out so I had a really yeah. good coach and and he talent ID'd me and then he's like, Hey, you know, Katie, like come to the BC, um, to that, to the snowboard team. And like, let, let's see where, we'll, where we'll go. So I was like, okay, cool. That sounds, that sounds all right. A little bit of organization. My mom liked it. Cause my mom's like, you know, she's like organized type thing. And she's like, Oh, like structure. <laughs> and <laughs> so she's like, okay, let's, let's do it. So yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, um, I ended up hooking up with them. And and that was actually the season, the end of that season. By the end of that season, that's when I went in and I and I won nationals. Right. And and so and that was that was the kickoff of like, oh, okay, national team, World Cups. And then I knew that, you know, if you you're on then I was like, oh, if I'm doing World Cups, then um, you know, my first World Cup was was in two thousand and three or four mm-hmm. in Whistler. And I did fairly well you know i was like middle of the pack which is which is all right you know yeah first time um out, yeah. yeah so that, that yeah, yeah so that's that's what kind of kicked off the start of like the like you know olympics might be a thing yeah but mm. it wasn't like so, like nowadays like you're right kids see uh you know youtube or they see see it on tv and they're like oh i want to I go to the olympics yeah. right i want to i want to do that yeah so did you, yeah. as, a, as in general sporting background then, so obviously you've come to snowboarding by today's standards relatively late, but by that time, pretty much the same as a lot of people. But did you have, I don't know, a, a gymnastic background or, you know, something that would give you those like acrobatic skills or was that something you just learned on the slopes? Oh, no. Like I come from a pretty sporty family. Like my brother, he's six years older than me. And he was like, my whole family's always water skied. And water skiing was our thing. Like, um, I think I said before that when people are like, oh, did you want to go to the Olympics? I'm like, no, 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 I want it to stand on top of the water ski pyramid at SeaWorld. That that was my dream. Because that's like, <laughs> we did water skiing and we'd go down to Florida, you know, because I'm like, I'm from Toronto. So to escape the cold and March break, my folks would drive down to Florida and, you know, my brother and I did wakeboarding camp. And so I did a little bit of, of gymnastics, but we did wakeboarding. Like my, my brother was like national champion for like six years in Canada. And he's like, my brother's 46 and he can still do his same wakeboard run in his, that he did in his twenties. You know, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I like the sound of your brother. <laughs> Actually, yeah, so at, this, at this point, you know, one of the things this is really, really great because one of the whole essence of our podcast, as you know, is we're talking about longevity. How do we create longevity? Yes, of whatever. Life. Yeah, whatever anyone's sport or activity is, whether it's mountain hiking or trekking or whether it's doing sports like snowboarding or wakeboarding or a golfer or a climber we're, you know we're covering runners and, and all sorts but to hear that your brother's still out there doing that stuff or can do that stuff at 46 having started it as a kid this is exactly what we're about isn't it this is we want to help people and you know some of our other podcasts you know we're touching on with people who are expert physios or sports therapists or chiropractors and, and this is what we want is to give people a flavor of training techniques or uh, treatment methods if they've got injuries and things that can help them attain that longevity so this is great that you're running you're and you're still out there you're i know you're still on the half pipe occasionally aren't you <laughs> so like i'm 40 right and like okay we're down here in new zealand and we got um i have a half pipe near me this like i came down to cardrona to train like since 2003 um 2004 so um <laughs> like it's it's what the half pipe that is close to me like down in new zealand that, that i've been there for a really long time seen it, seen okay. it. anyway so um I, I like i i had a baby two years ago and um so i kind of like had a break from the half pipe and so but we're, we got locked down here or stuck down here for covid so my husband i'm like okay let's do the winter here so i'm um, <laughs> and the half pipe opens and and so i'm like 
asking every single girlfriend, whatever I have been like, Oh, can you take Riley? So that like, I can go up and ride pipe. And like, <laughs> and I, I mean, I work for a snowboard company too. So like, it makes sense that like, I should be up there, but I'm like, I'm, and I, I got lucky. I, I one of um, the kids who were in the, the snowboard program up there, his dad, Danny, I'm going to give a shout out to Danny. Cause he was like my boy this season. D- Danny right. be like, just bring Riley up, man. I'll, I'll take care of him. Like, what's we'll hang out at the b- bottom of the half pipe? So at least like probably five or six days. I was like, and like, you got to like, it's to get up to the half pipe up there. Like you got to be up there early. Like, like the, the, um, what call a palma or, or T-bar starts spinning at mm-hmm. 745. So, right. and it only runs until about 11. So like, I, I got to get uh... like. I got to get Riley up there. I got to get my kid up there. I got to get myself up there, like all organized. Like you have to hike up to the top of the half pipe or to the bottom of the half pipe because none of the chairlifts are running until 8.30. So like I'm I'm doing, I'm like doing it, getting my kid ready, my board, waxing my board, scraping it, you know, taking, getting Riley's gear ready because my buddy Danny was like putting Riley on his board and pulling around the bottom of the half pipe and taking him to the learner's <laughs> slope and stuff. Well, well, I'm up there like riding, riding half pipe. Like I'm, I'm like, I'm going to get to my Olympic run, <laughs> you know, it's like I was, <laughs> my, my husband kind of gave me a little bit of a hard time because he's like, he'd be like, what are you training for? I'm like, well, I see that. <laughs> and then like, Life, Sunday, yeah. like at, the end, at the end of the season, I looked at it and I'm like, is in that area, there's a few different like when New Zealand Kiwi Winter Olympians that had gone to the to the Olympics for half pipe. Um, but like I'm the only one there that's like trying to like get every kid, person to watch my kids so that I can go ride mm. <laughs> so that I can catch some air, you know, and go fast and like scare myself and put myself well, this, in these this, like. <laughs> it's quite funny as well, because this this kind of highlights because with this podcast that we're doing it suddenly explains everything because. You're in New Zealand. I'm here in England. A lot of our guests have been in in the States somewhere. So we've had this scheduling issue, haven't we? And, and I now understand why you're so keen to get the podcast done and dusted for what is about seven o'clock until eight o'clock in the morning for you so that you can fly <laughs> out the door. And I've actually seen you disappearing as soon as the podcast was finished. I've seen you from the back um, you know, view grabbing a, your ski gear and your clothing and going out the door virtually. <laughs> Oh yeah, you guys no, are still chatting. No. I'm like, no, guys, I gotta go. Like the the palma is turning. Like people are being pulled up that mountain. Like I need to go catch some air. You know, like oh, now it yeah, makes yeah, sense. So. yeah, okay, brilliant. So I'm I'm like the only one up there, and I, and I'm calling my girlfriends. I'm like, guys, like your kids are in school. Like get your butts up here. Like so, my one girlfriend, she's gone to two Olympics. Julie Ambrace, amazing woman. And I said to her, cause like, she's kind of like, you know, oh, oh yeah, the half pipe's open, whatever. And then one day we were having a couple of drinks and I was like, Jew, you know, all of our like surfer friends, whatever, you know, when the surf's up, they're gone. When the surf's mm. up, they're in the water. They know there's a limited time, catch those waves, get it. And I'm like, Jew, man, the surf's up, pipes up, like, yeah. come on up, let, let's go, let's go do this. And she was like, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, and she's getting all jacked up to to get out there again. And she came out. We had a couple days. We had a couple really good days together. You know, trying to get her. Oh, let's do yeah. a five forty. Oh man, oh, I haven't done this. Like, it's, like what we're riding, it's a big half pipe. It's twenty two feet. The walls are twenty two feet tall. Like when you're standing in the bottom of the half pipe, it's two stories, which is what we call the deck or the kind of the top yeah. of the half pipe. It's a, and you got to go fast. Like you forget how fast you have to go to like launch yourself up this wall to like even just catch, you know, a foot or two of air. So, mm. so we're like, you know, the old old girls up there, like, like, yeah, we gotta go fast. Like, uh, follow me in, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, oh, it's, 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 it's so funny. good to hear. It's brilliant. I love it. So, what was she? Was she a New Zealand competitor who you? Uh, boarded against or was yeah she... yeah yeah we we competed with each other we don't say against in snow like I, I don't, in snowboard at the top of the half pipe it's a little bit different and slope style like the camaraderie up there is like we're, we're actually cheering people on and it's funny because people from other sport who are like in race or something like that they come up to the top of the slope style course and the, they, the vibe that they feel they always say they're like I've never experienced that in competitive sport before. Mm. Like everybody is like really cheering everyone on and everyone up there are buddies and you got like, we travel the world together and we, we go through this, you know, we go like, we get, 
doing what we do in this half pipe thing, it's sometimes like we're going to have to world cups and you travel to like Spain or whatever. And like the half pipe's not done yet. Like you, you got a world cup that weekend. Cause like you show up, you get two days of training and then it's like go time, you go compete. Mm. And sometimes because of weather or because of the pipe isn't done yet, you might get one day of training. You might get an hour of training. You might get no training. And then you're just like in this, you know, kind of new half pipe and they're like, go, go, go wow. do your stunts. <laughs> so you get all, all these. And then like, you know, they lose your luggage and then you can't compete or you got to like go compete on someone else's gear. So like you go through all these like stories with these people that it really builds this like lifelong mm. bond. And, you know, you remember, hey, remember when we were in Japan and the backhoe was still in the half pipe when we showed up and, you know. But this is, I think yeah. as a spectator, this is one of the things that I've seen. And I just love watching the, these aspects of, of snowboarding because as a, you know, I've done com- competitive sport and I've never seen anything like it. And you think it, it's just brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. You see it when there's a team maybe cheering each other on either in the same team in gymnastics or whatever, they get excited. But to actually see the rival, the rivals, the competitors against each other, and at the end of it, you get down to the bottom and everybody's getting there on the podium or whatever, and everybody's happy for everybody else. And it's just the most remarkable thing. In my opinion, this must have launched millions of people into snowboarding because they can see the fun and they can see that camaraderie. And I think it's just brilliant. But the competitiveness is still there, isn't it? There's absolutely yeah, yeah, no Yeah, the question. competitiveness yeah. is still there. So like this season, um, Julian Bray and, and mm-hmm. I like – so we're in the master's division now, right? Because we're over 35. And actually, mm-hmm. I think that like they're, we're, they're supposed to, we're supposed to be in the grand master's division, but the, 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 <laughs> the field is so small that they just lump us all into masters. So this season, there was three big contests that anyone was kind of allowed to go in. There was a bank slalom, which is kind of like, uh, you know, slalom course. So you're going left, right, left, right. But they they build up these banks on the side, these berms on the side that you're kind of going around these berms through this course right. and it's timed to race. So there was a bank slalom. There is um, the New Zealand national border cross race. So you go, that's the one where you're like starting a gate. There's four of us that go down. Yeah. Four yeah. go down together. Like kind of like going across. <laughs> we, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. So you're familiar. <laughs> and then there's like the best, contest that i think is in the world the best contest i've ever done it rivals at the olympics it's called the the mini pipe world championships right. and um so there's these three contests over the season and Ju, because she's like a little bit bigger than me she actually went to the olympics for border cross so she has a lot more race experience she she beat me it, it, right. <laughs> she beat me in the first two the first two races right so at the end of the season i was like I told my husband i'm like okay, this is like, the, this is for the mini pipe champs, right? And this is a little bit right. more freestyle. It's judged, right? You have to wear a costume as well. And uh, and I was like, babe, I really want to beat you in this. <laughs> because I was like, she's won the first two ones, but like- <laughs> Those competitive you know, like, juices were champs, bubbling up. Right? And like, yeah. part of it is your costume. So I was tell like, us, I really, need a, I really need a good costume. So I like went out, got, got my costume. Which you know, was? And, uh, and so- uh see this year i was like a a onesie dinosaur last year my costume was on point i was like this pikachu you know and you're like bright yellow and everyone can see you against the white snow pikachu was like (laughs) i got like people running up taking pictures with me because i'm pikachu anyway so this year i was a a green dinosaur and so uh i ended up i ended up beating (laughs) her like you know so like you snowboarding hard i did some flips and stuff and and i ended up beating her so i was like stoked i got i got the last one but it's funny because in the morning she was like katie man you're on my radar she was like i I tried to do i tried to do my maneuver but it didn't work out for her but mine worked out for me as it goes you know and and i ended up beating her but i kind of wanted i want to ask you something is there photographical video evidence of the pikachu and the green jolly green monster available oh yeah right yeah, yeah, yeah. okay so here's the um, deal here's the deal I... here's the deal so our sponsor <laughs> for this event barefoot science who we both know very well we're not going to labor too much about the insults but what i'm going to suggest in fact what i'm going to insist upon is that you release a couple of those videos for them to put out on their uh, website yeah. 
I will. Uh, yeah. To link to our, our podcast because I can't think we'll of a better them. way of promoting it. Yeah, do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll oh, upload them to, to the uh to the Instagram or Facebook for sure. I'll send them over. But cool. yeah, so I kind of wanted her to win though, because then we, I was like, oh, Jew, it's the triple crown. Cause like, if you're over 40, we like all of the contests are for the kids. It actually isn't that much right. for uh, <laughs> us who are like, you know, in thir- over 30 or whatever, or yeah. even over 25. So I was kind of wanted Jew to win. Cause I was like, Jew, then you got the triple crown, man. You won the triple crown. <laughs> Yeah, so forget forget so the, there, I, two, forget next the two Olympics, get the triple crown. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, <laughs> totally. I, 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 it was it was it was pretty funny, but yeah, yeah, no, that's but, great. But, yeah. So she's my girlfriend, and we compete together, and you know there there is a lot of camaraderie over the com- competitiveness. You know, but that's it, wonderful. At the end yeah. of the day, like we wouldn't be in it if we weren't competitive. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. You have to have that. It's a must, isn't it? Yeah. So, okay, you got to Sochi. Let's just to finish off yeah. nearly at the end of this podcast. <laughs> so you've got you got to Sochi. How did it go? What happened? Yeah, so I get the phone call and we're we're in Quebec and I find out Crispin's coming with me. We're 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 going. We're, we're doing this right. And so like we're the whole like once you get named to the team, you know that like that's like where the the magic happens because like you know you're starting to that now you're a part of team canada you're not you're not just like on the canadian snowboard team now you're part of team canada and mm. they send like you know you go somewhere and, and you start doing all of these appearances with the team and you're getting your kit and it's just like the coolest feeling ever wow. like the coolest you're you're all decked out and like and then canada canada's paying for like you know or your country pays for you to go right so we got like upgraded it um because like the canadians airline they were a part of it so we got upgraded to go over right. to sochi but i mean it was a little ske- like it was a little sketchy because sochi was kind of like it's in russia right so it actually had like a really really low attendance because all the stuff with like you know all the political stuff was going on then yeah and uh it was getting like even my parents were like oh sh- should we be going you know, like it, or my dad was like, well, should we be going? My mom's like, we're, we're going. I, she's like, I don't care. We're going. <laughs> so they're, they're booking their tickets. I got, a, I got a feeling your mom is a force to be reckoned with, I, I'm gathering. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's definitely, definitely a force to be reckoned with. So, <laughs> you know, we, we get there. And um, once you hit soil, you're in what they call the Olympic bubble. And you, you can't really leave the Olympic bu- bubble once once you're going, you know. So, yeah. Um, getting there and, and like sochi was like rough because like we show up into these buildings and the buildings are unfinished all the landscaping's all unfinished there's like all of these i don't know if any of you guys like followed the olympics but like bobsledders were getting stuck in bathrooms and they were having to like bust through the walls and stuff and like uh wow. plumbing wasn't working <laughs> this this is the kind of thing that wasn't really reported i can't remember it anyway so this is incredible isn't it <laughs> Wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, the the Canadians uh, reported it because there were Canadian bobsledders that got they literally, yeah. and then like they, there was like uh, bathroom stalls where like men's bathroom like toilet stalls where there wasn't like a divider wall between them. It was like right. toilets by each. <laughs> <laughs> very very cozy. <laughs> yeah, 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 oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but it yeah, no, but it's awesome because like. You get up into this to this village and you're there with all the athletes that are within your venue. So within our venue, we were in the mountain one. There was like all the cross country skiers, the bobsledders. Yeah. And any like sliding sports was pretty much all up there. So like you go into like the dining hall, right? And it's like 24 hour dining hall, salad bar, whatever. It's crazy. And what we would do is you'd try and like pick out which athlete does what. You know, like you look at that dude, that that dude looks big, man. He's got to be a bobsledder, you know, that dude looks a little skinny dude. He's, he's a cross country skier. (laughs) It was pretty cool. And like you're with all of these like different athletes from all over the world and you got the pin trading, right? So it was my goal that, cause like I I knew my team, so I didn't want to sit with them. So it was my goal that whenever I went and ate, I would go ask a, a different athlete, like a different sport athlete and go and sit with them and have lunch with them that was like my thing i was like so that i could trade pins and 
and go like you know meet all these people it was a cool experience like different experiences trade, trade pins explain to me sorry what's tra- when you say trade pins so uh, in the Olympics, there's this big thing, pin trade. Like, you know, like the little like lapel pins that like it's a yeah. country. Okay. And so, so the Canada gives you like, you know, all these different um, types of pins that you go and you trade. And so you have this lanyard and you like are going up to people. And you're like, I'll give you a Canadian pin for, you know, your pin. Oh, wow. And you try and get okay. all of as many different countries that you could get. And like as a country, you try and get all like the the small countries right so like i actually got a jamaican one from the jamaican bobsled team because that was like rare there's only <laughs> six of them up there it's not like there's like you know a cross country team or the, there's like all these six dudes up there from jamaica so i got like Brilliant. a coveted jamaican one or like thailand you know that one was really coveted as well so um yeah you do all this pin trading and and uh yeah it's like it's, it's really cool so in the yeah. Olympic Village was an amazing experience. Uh, Canada takes care of you. You're like physios and and um, like bodily support people on call. Mm. Like you need a trainer, you go there, they help you out. You need to get worked out. And actually, I got an in- I got injured right before my event. I was like, oh, I'm gonna go do some de- just go do some deadlifts, like a quick, you know, like a nervous system one, like really heavy, like mm-hmm. one rep type thing of like just to kind of get my keep my nervous system firing and like that that's kind of another thing that we haven't really touched on is the support team that you build going into the olympics has to be on point like even before you get to the olympics like all the physios that i worked with Mm. my folks my coaches all i had mentors going in like we it's it's an individual sport but i you have a whole team behind you that normally doesn't get seen or mentioned and like they're rock stars too, you know? Anyway, so I got injured, did this like deadlift, ended up popping a rib out my back, out on my left side. And then I was like in at the physio guys getting like cracked, getting needled. Like they, they had to like work on me pretty hard, um, you know, and I, I had to settle. And, and the night before, like, and I had a really good mental coach going in and he prepared me because he was like, you know, Katie, the night before, like you're, you're not going to be able to sleep. Just sleep isn't a, isn't a thing. So this is what you got to do. Mm-hmm. So I, and it, you basically go into like a meditative state and, and, you know, that that's enough to carry you over to go perform the next day. So like, I, I don't really remember going to sleep. I remember like I said, being in more of like a meditative state the night before, right. you know, with, and with so, things like mantras or just visualizations or vi- visualizations for sure. And mm. um, we always talk about, you know, goal setting, you know, you set your goal, but then you think of the process. Right. And I was thinking mm-hmm. about my whole process and what I needed to do to be able to get to my end goal. So anyways, mm. that, that all must have worked out pretty. And, and like you, I worked with a really good uh, mental trainer sport excel to to get me to the zone right like because mm. that, that's the magical spot that's where in high performance like you need to get to this zone where you're basically not thinking about anything you're just doing it's performing it's you know first nature yep. to just go out and do it so um anyway let, let me skip forward to to being at the good part right so i'm there <laughs> i'm at the top of the half pipe Crispin and I, my co- oh, yeah. so Crispin go actually competes before me, and he kind of mm-hmm. like shits the bed a little bit. Sorry, Crispin, I love you, but like he could have done way better. <laughs> he could have done way better, but but he granted he was thinking about me. He did all right, like middle of the pack, but <laughs> yeah, I wanted him to as being his coach lead. I wanted. Him I was going to gonna say, yeah, <laughs> but did- he did what he needed to do, and he got there, and he was there for me. So anyway, now it's my event, and. We're at the top of the half pipe and, you know, and it's kind of like, you know, Katie, like we really did it now. This is it. Mm. We're at the top of the half pipe. The lights are on you. Your parents are down in the crowd. Everyone in Canada is watching you. Wow. And I was like, okay. So I pull out of the gate, look at down the top of the half pipe and just give a big breath and just go down, you know, and I, and I, and I do my run mm. and uh, I get down to the bottom of the half pipe and CBC's there. Uh, Canadian broadcasting company and they, they put a mic in your face and they're like, Oh, Katie, you just did your half pipe run. You know, why don't you tell us about their, your, their run? And I like went blank. Right. And I, just, <laughs> I was like, I, 
I don't, I don't, I just kind of went blank and I was like, I don't really remember. And they, <laughs> like, they don't Wrong. know, they're not, wow. they, I don't know if they've been in the zone before, but they're like, oh, okay. okay. And I was like, oh yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> I like go off to the side and my mental coach, Bob Palmer, <laughs> he was like, he was like, that was the best part. He was like that. <laughs> yeah, no, it showed how tight you were in the zone. So my, my mental coach, Bob Palmer, he was at home in Canada. And I remember him being like, Katie, man, that, that was the best part. That was the best part. You were in the zone. That, that was, mm. it worked, you know, we, we had made it. And I was like, yeah, oh, it was in the zone. And, 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 you know, it came out and I, I ended up getting, getting to go to semi I ended up being top Canadian. I got 13. Okay. So I had just missed out mm-hmm. on finals, made it through semifinals. And I, I was top Canadian, which to be honest, you know, I, I was never the rider that went the biggest, you know, I, right. I was, I was top in Canada, but I was always kind of like, you know, middle of the pack out of like, you know, the 40 riders or so that would be at that there. I was getting like between 20th and kind of like 15th spot. So to get 13th at the Olympics, that's and fantastic. top Canadian to beat out all yeah. because all these other girls had more experience than me. Like my one colleague, she was in it since she was like, you know, eight years old. She she's from Whistler. She was in it for a really long time. It was her like fourth Olympics or something like that, or third Olympics. So, you know, to come out and beat the athletes like that. And then also, you know, like I said, I, I had to run this like parallel program to the national team. So like, I was like, freaking underdog i was the underdog mm. and to like come out on top and and of the canadians and, and get you know kind of like that top 15 at the olympics well that like that i was stoked for for me <laughs> you wow. know I, it's absolutely I mean, astonishing i mean that, that whole story you know the, the the fight to actually just get in the team you know get or bypass the team in order to get into the team that's it's just such a great story you should be super proud. Yeah. You really should be. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I yeah. mean, I was in tears. My mom was in tears. Like my, my parents were, were over the moon and, and same with, you know, everyone. I had so much support from Canada and mm. support staff. And like I said, you know, it's, it seems like it's an individual sport, but you have like all of these amazing people with years of experience behind you. Yeah. And, and yeah, but I, I was lucky. Like, you know, I had good people planning for me and, you know, I had really good mentors. Um, you know, I had Crispin and yeah, like, yeah, my support team, they, they are the ones that really got, got me there. Mm. I, I, I didn't, I performed, but they put me in the right state. And yeah. Yeah. Just on that note, because of course, one of our guests, I think his, we, we, we interviewed him a while ago. He was involved in that process, wasn't he? Um, yeah, Scott. Scott. Yeah. Yeah. And Jeff so, too, Jeff Stapleton, Scott, um, and Lance as well. You know, they're, they're, mm. they're all big players. So and, any, yeah. any listeners out there who are interested in those aspects of it? I mean, Katie was massively helped with, with fitness and, and certain work by Jeff Stapleton, who was one of our previous guests. And uh, just yesterday, I think the, the podcast went out with, uh, let's just say yesterday, uh, what are we on? It would have been somewhere around the 25th, 26th of October with Scott Griswood, who's um, who worked, I know, worked with you extensively yeah. after you'd had um, uh, had some problems. So, yeah, they, if you want to hear it, yeah, from I that mean, side I worked, it, check those podcasts. Out. I actually, I actually worked with them, like, because like Sochi wasn't yet quite the end of my story. I, I, I went for another Olympic cycle because I had done so well and I, now I was being supported by Canada and I was getting post secondary mm-hmm. education, blah, blah, blah. I, Oh, I went for another Olympic cycle that didn't end as well. And, and I, so right. I went back to the national team. I went on their program and I kind of had a relapse of what happened in, in Vancouver. Like um, I, w- I was supposed to be going to the games. I qualified Canada spot. I was, I was second, second in line, like second on the points thing to go. And the first, first place and I were like super close. Like we, there was only like a 10 point spread behind us and there was a 200 point spread behind me and the next one. So, um, like, it looked like I was going to go, but, I. Uh, so I, one thing I would say to people who are out there with national teams is that you need to read your contracts really well. And if they want to do something that's like an amendment, you need to like really research what that amendment means. So when we were going, it, it was like 90 days out to go to Korea. Right. And as I said, I was in this placing, right. 
And so 90 days out of going to the Olympics and they, they decide to put this amendment in of, um, of a minimum standard. Okay. So you had to like ride these certain tricks at the certain height um, to be able to go. So was, it, what, was this what, the Olympic organization itself? This or is, the this is Canada snowboard. This is the Canadian right, snowboard. Okay. This is my, my, you know, my national, Your my national governing board. associated, yeah. whatever. Right. Yep. So they, they decide, and we've already signed our contracts. We've signed our yearly contracts. This is an amendment that they're coming to put in, right? For mm-hmm. whatever reason, like in my, in my mind, they shouldn't have done this. Yeah. Four years to be able to sort this stuff yeah. out before. 90 days so, to go. Yeah. 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 So 90 days ago, they come to us, put this amendment in. Right. And, and they hold it over our heads. Actually, they go, you can't have your world cup start unless you sign that contract, which yeah. is like, has this whole other thing. Right. So. I'm like, oh, God, sign the contract, blah, blah, blah. Right. So then they turn around and they're like, "Okay, you need to be able to show this minimum standard. And as I said before, I'm not the biggest rider. Like I didn't ride the biggest, but I was like the most consistent. Like if it was a snowstorm Mm -hmm. or whatever, Katie puts down her run. Right. So and that's kind of what happened in Sochi as well. Like the pipe was really beat up and but like I could ride. So I put down my run. Anyways. So I signed this thing. They go like, okay, now we, we want to see this minimum standard. And it was like really out of there. So we had to show it on film, but we only had to show it on film one time. And then it went, it went to their board and their board looked at it and, and their, their board a had no females on it. And B it was like in this 90 days before, like we're supposed to go to the Olympics. And we had already spent three years, four years yeah. preparing to go up to, to, to Korea, to Pyeongchang. Anyways, long story short, I can't, I, I do the tricks, but not quite at the height that they wanted it. You know, they wanted it at five feet. I was doing it at like four feet, you know, which is like right. still, you know, but can, I'm consistent. These, these are the chicks, like the one, one chick was like, she could only do it one time. Right. And it was her first time going to Olympics anyway. So I'm the one that gets in hot water. I'm the, I qualified Canada spot. I get in hot water. I, I, I can't do this like minimum standard and i'm like i'm stressed about it right so like Mm. and i'm performing under the stress that i've never kind of felt before and i I was like i was breaking down i was like really not in a good spot ended up missing it right and like it came and and i had to take i had to take canada snowboard to sport court over the thing and i got this like rock star lawyer right and so i'm still fundraising because i still had money so i did this gala fundraised all this money this gala for my snowboarding and i ended up having to pay it all to this sport lawyer to try and get me into the games right and and he's like rock star he's like lawyer to the maple leafs (laughs) he's done Mm -hmm. raptors like he is like professional professional sports lawyer and he looked at it and he was like katie this like this whole situation, like you just shouldn't be in it. But I hate to say it, the the national teams they put in all these safeguards to protect their butts. So, yeah. you know, at the, at the end of it, he's like, I might not be able to get you off of it. Is it like he's like, we, we, we'll take them to court. We'll see what they say. And even the the judge or whatever the um the middle guy he the the judge he was like, yeah, th- this isn't right. But because of this, then this is going to block you. But he, but even he was like that. Like what you got, what you guys have gone through, it shouldn't happen, right? Like it, it came down so to the wire that my name was on the start list in Pyeongchang. That's how like close it was. Like I was supposed to be there. Oh I was supposed goodness. to be there, and they ended up giving my spot to this other girl. And like the the Canadian team didn't do very well. Like. Two of the girls fell, didn't even right. get like a placing. And so I didn't quite watch it because I, I was, I was like broken. I was like heartbroken, broken, like spent four years doing this. I was, mm. you know, I had my team behind me and, and it didn't end up happening, but, but wow. you know, that's just, Gosh. that's sport as well. You know, politics, right? It is. That's astonishing. Well, well thank you for sharing yeah. that with us. It's pretty, <laughs> I don't mean to end on a downer, you know, the good thing is that my love of sports still carries on. And I'm that 40 year old mom with her two year old at the bottom of the half. I'm trying to get everyone to watch watch your kid so I can try to get my Olympic run back. (laughs) And I tell you, you know, one of the other podcasts we did, which unfortunately you couldn't be on, I really wanted you to be on a podcast that we did with a bunch of uh, young 
uh, British climbers, GB climbers. And um, one of them was, uh, well, both fantastic climbers. One of them had just gone to her first world championships and her aim is to go to the Olympics. And I was so looking forward to you being a part of that podcast and sharing a little bit of these experiences. And in a funny kind of way, you know, it was, it, you, I can't remember why you couldn't make it, but it would have been such a life lesson and a, a sports lesson for her to hear. I'm going to make sure she listens to this podcast, um, Isabella. And there's a girl called Jess. Didn't make it because I was at the half pipe. No, just... Is that where you were? Ah, I knew it. But, <laughs> no, uh, no, 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 no. I did, I did have something coming on. Oh, <laughs> yeah, so that, that but, uh, you the, know what? Do you a speak? Silver Are you a mentor for me now too? To well, I was just going to get into that. One of the silver linings for me was that when I was at in Calgary at the Olympic Training Center, I was trying to do this minimum standard, but um, you know, I really connected with a, a, one of the young girls there at the time. I think she was like twelve or something like that, and mm -hmm. I ended up kind of I, I talent ID'd her, talked to her, kind of took her under my wing and started mentoring her, and like I, I rode three or four days with her, like like calling her up being like Brooke we're going to the pipe like let's 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 meet up let's do this let's let's ride together right so I kind of got her hooked and and I her dad was there and I talked to her dad and I told her about my story and my experiences and these are the red flags and you know this is what to watch out for these are the coaches that you want to go work with these are the programs blah 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 and it turns out that you know she debuted in China and um, you know did oh, did really fantastic. well and she's and she's now on the national team and um, you know they've heeded to some of my warnings and and uh, I don't know what happened in Canada snowboard but now they got like a phenomenal coach his name's Bug Keen and he actually was with Sean White I don't know if you guys remember Sean White the Flying I, Tomato I heard of Sean White yeah yeah he's huge he's like one you know three Olympics and. Mm. And uh, Bud was with him, I think, for the first one or two. And uh, and he's a phenomenal coach. So now he's coaching the Canadian team because I'm like, holy cow, they're like pulling out all the stops now for this mm. this rider that I got to mentor in, um, you know, because because she's kind of like the strength of the team now. So now now I see her and I see her ride and she's riding really well. And, and it makes I don't want to I'm not claiming her or anything, but it makes me feel good that. I might have had something to do with sparking that love and that determination. And, and maybe she saw my story or, or, you know, looked up to me or whatever. But mm. but I definitely like, you know, <clears throat> I was mentoring her kind of for a bit. But, you know, now she's kind of moved on, as you do. Mm. Um, no. But it makes I, me feel I said earlier, that. I said earlier in this podcast, you you know, just you made a reference about your mom. And I said she's obviously a force to be reckoned with. Well, I think whatever, <laughs> whatever force. She has to be reckoned with, Katie. You have it in spades. You clearly are a, are a fantastic, well, obviously a fantastic athlete, but the passion that you've expressed during the podcast that we've just been doing, I'd, oh, it's been spellbinding. And, yeah, <laughs> and helping that girl, absolutely, she cannot but have benefited from that advice and that information. And her dad will have been soaking up that political you know, the, and the administrative stuff because as a parent of course all he wants to do is make sure his daughter gets as best possible help and, and progresses as much as possible and you you clearly did help with that so you should be really pleased with yourself wow well, thanks, so now two-year-old riley yeah <laughs> is it where, where, where's he aiming for we you know snowboarder of the future <laughs> Uh, well, so on, I'm at the bottom of the, I have him at the bottom half pipe with me. So I always get, you know, like people coming up being like, oh, do, you know, do you, is Riley going to like go to the Olympics and snowboard and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. So like guys right now in, in the half pipe, they're doing like quads and triples. Yeah. And, you know, they're going like 25, 30 feet out of the half pipe. Right. And I, I look at that and that just makes my stomach turn. <laughs> See, it makes my stomach turn to think that like my son and I'm like, no, you know what? You know, what's really good. <laughs> music <laughs> but i actually got told this like i'm down here and they told me this my aunt told me the story about this all blacks player like all blacks they're the new zealand rugby team and they're yeah, really yeah. famous because we were talking about like concussions and blah blah and i'm like oh i work mm. with these guys that have the technology that can detect uh if they have a baseline they de can detect a concussion within three minutes but, um, you know, leagues and everything are blocking this from happening because they want their players on the field. They're paying for their yeah. players. They want them on the field if they're concussed, whatever. But there's all of these lawsuits that are going through to, mm. to you know, sue these people, whatever. Right. Yeah, so, we have it. We have it in the UK as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, so rugby, that's with rugby, yeah. Yeah, so this all black player, I guess they kind of had the same thing. Like they're like, Oh, is your son gonna go and be an all black and play rugby? And then the all black player was like, Nope, golf. Mm. And so now his son is like a top golf player and like on the PGA and whatever. And he's going oh. and, and killing it in the golf. I'm trying to remember what his name is, but it's, a, it's escaping me right yeah. now. But. <laughs> I, heard, I heard, I heard something about this actually. Yeah. I can't remember his name either, but yeah. Go right. Yeah, and, okay. And, and they're like golf. Cause yeah, you yeah. know, concu- like now we know way more about concussions and brain injuries and things mm. like that. And, yeah. and yeah. So <laughs> people ask me about Riley and I'm like, yeah music but now i'm like oh gol- golf's a good one because then i get yeah, to go well, like golf, sunny spots but golf another, is gonna be good. another one a, another well, one great... like my husband's a surfer right and you guys on right. kelly slater i'm like surfing surfing's good too <laughs> well they can get some bumps and bruises can't they i remember reading about a girl a fantastic surfer marina her name i call marina she was an american girl but she had the worst concussions imaginable but um really yeah oh crikey oh, yeah. that was a a huge article about it. it was a brilliant article but um now what i was going to say the golf thing be really interesting because one of the future guests that you and i are going to get to to interview jointly is um is an ex european tour and pga tour and Ryder cup player um so we're going to get a a picture of the life as a golf pro um oh, he's cool. now a com- yeah he's now a commentator for for sky on the on one of their major commentators on the golf world so that's a guy called Andrew Coltart, and he's going to be one of our guests in the future. So that'll be fun. And we can, um, we've got to try and remember that New Zealand guy's name because Andrew will know him. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, totally. Go, 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 go find it. Anyway, Katie, I'm going to draw this to a close. I think is there, this is so much more than I anticipated it was going to be. I, you know, I just thought this would be fun. We should, we should get Katie's story. And I had no idea that the story was going to be that uh, in depth and that varied and, so like a well, it was like a half pipe <laughs> ride in itself, wasn't it? With ups and downs and twists and turns. So, oh, my mom's always like, "You need it. to write a book. We need to write you a you book." Should do. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You know, I'm like, "Oh, yeah, yeah we'll see." <laughs> yeah, you should, you should, you should, you should. So, thank you for that. Um, so, we're going to sign out jointly in our normal way. So, I'm going to bid you good morning. Thank you for being yeah. my guest on our co- on our podcast. <laughs> yeah, I, I got my coffee, and you finished your goose goose. Gooseberry Goose, gin? Gooseberry, gooseberry gin, Goose, yes. It's, gooseberry gin, yeah. Yeah, gooseberry <laughs> for, for medicinal purposes only, of course. Of so course, I bid of you, course. <laughs> I bid you good night, wish you good morning, and we'll speak again soon. Yeah, have a good right, evening. Okay. Thank yeah, you, all of our thank listeners. You. Thank you, guys. See you again. You've been listening to the Born to be Barefoot podcast with myself, Kate Tsuyuki, and the wonderful Stuart Gordon. Please remember to hit the subscribe button and give us a five-star review. We'll see you guys next week.